So good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to everybody here in the room and welcome to, please come and sit in the middle, sir. It's just fine. No, I reserve for you. Um, and welcome also to people who are joining us on the live uh, webinar. Uh, good to have you with us. We're also recording the session for people who can't uh, be with us either in person or online today so they can watch it back uh, later. And if you really enjoy it, you can also watch it yourself again. Um, it's great that you so many people have come out on this very hot day. Uh, we're not expecting any fire drills. And if it does go off, there are uh, exits at the back, but there's also an accessible exit just down here or on the left-hand side for anybody who needs, needs help. So we have uh, a program, as you see, to celebrate 30 years of the Epic Norfolk um, study and to say thank you for all your efforts over that time. We'll talk about what we've achieved, what uh, we are doing in terms of preserving samples, preserving data, and then using both of those to, to really uh, fulfill the wish that I think you all and the trust that you placed in us at the beginning, which was, can you maximize the information and the knowledge that we get from all the data that you provided? And that's what we've been trying to do. And that's what we're gonna tell you about this morning. We're then gonna have uh, a panel discussion to get uh, discourse going. I'm really pleased that Peter Ghibli is going to join that. Peter's the chairman of the EPIC participant advisory panel and, um, it will explain what that is when we get to that point, and then we'll open it up to questions from you. And we, so that people online can hear the questions, can you wait until the roving microphone gets to you before you ask it? Otherwise, people won't be able to hear. And we have a mechanism in the on the webinar that people who are watching this online can submit questions, and we'll try and address all of those uh, in the course of the Q and A. So um, you will have seen outside uh, a series of posters from some of our PhD students and also some of our postdocs, and many of them are available to talk about those posters. I'd just like to say thank you to all them for traveling up and for, um, for making the effort to make these posters. There will be an opportunity afterwards briefly when you're, when you're leaving if you want to go back and have a a discussion with them about that. Um, this is uh, to remind you that we have various newsletters that go out to people that uh, provide information about what we're doing. One of them is more general, it's called uh, Epigram, which is about our unit and all of its work of which Epic Norfolk is part. And the second is about a uh, specific Epic Norfolk newsletter. And you can subscribe at those uh, addresses and there are um, um, printouts of this outside and if you're really technically able which I'm not making any judgments about that but if you are you can scan those QR codes and get straight to the right place to subscribe. So you have provided uh, us with an enormous amount of data over the years and we're not going to try and describe the totality of that because that would be uh, impossible but we're gonna try and describe some of the major things that we have done over the years. And it's a real privilege and a pleasure for me to start today's uh, talks by introducing Professor Katie Kaur, who's one, who's one of the three people who had the vision to set up this study in the early 1990s. And she is now retired and should be sailing around Scotland at the moment, but she's kindly forgone that pleasure. Luckily, there's no wind, so she wouldn't have gone anywhere anyway. <laughs> but she's agreed to join us today. And in introducing Katie, I just want to say that those of us who are doing the science now, we really benefit not just from everything you've done as participants, but from our predecessors who set up this study, because it's a whole generational thing. It's 30 years, whole careers have come and gone, and people have retired. But we are fortunate that people like Katie set this study up. So thank you, Katie, and welcome. Thank you very much, Nick. And it's such a pleasure to be here and to meet all of you uh, again. 
it's, it's a privilege indeed to have been part of this study. And I just want to do a very brief summary of how it started. I'm sure you will be aware of that and what has happened in between the 30 years. So just briefly, the background is how did it all begin? Why did we do it? What did we do and what results have we got? Um, I do have a tendency to gabble, so I, please put up your hand if I'm going too fast and you can't follow me. As Nick said in his very kind words, the EPIC Norfolk population study was started by, you can see, and Nick was also being very modest, he was one of the ones right at the beginning, um, as part of a European collaboration, El Elio Riboli in the um, International Agency for Cancer coordinating study for 500,000 people in 10 countries across Europe. So the biggest study ever done at that time. Of course, now we have bigger studies like um, around the world, but that was unique at the time. And the idea was to try and understand health in a living human population as we get older to identify what we can do to improve our health. So as you know, 25,000 men and women yourselves from Epic um, from Norfolk were recruited and took part in a baseline survey in 1993 to 1997. So hence 30 years of follow up now. And you were all very kind in giving up so much of your time to provide a huge amount of information about yourselves, your lifestyles, as well as donating blood and urine samples to enable us to measure biologically many of the things that we're interested in, you are interested in. And the basic question is, how do we improve health and disability as we get older? So we're interested in all those endpoints, not just death, but cancer, heart disease, arthritis, quality of life. And there we've been enormously helped by all of you who have told us what you are interested in. So all we do as researchers really is receive what you tell us and report back to you what you, you've been doing. And to reduce the risk of things like fractures, dementia, we want to understand what the processes are. So we measure things like lung function, immune function, blood vessel function. Those are things that you let us do, um, uh, uh, bone density, et cetera. But most important of all, to identify the exposures that influence the rate at which we age. And some of these functions decline so that we are more at risk of these chronic conditions. And of course, you've spent a huge amount of time telling us about your diet, physical activity, psychosocial effects, as well as infections and the environment. We've also been able to measure the environment that you live in. So the things that are really special about Epic Norfolk is surprisingly before this study, we did have not have any data on middle-aged men and women in Britain. All the cohorts were young people or much earlier um, occupational cohorts. So this was the first time that we had such a big age range, including both men and women, because women had also been excluded from many studies. We wanted to measure exposures much better, diet, physical activity, etc. And we also wanted to measure the health outcomes, which is why you've been asked so much about your health, both the diseases you have, but also your functional quality of life, because those are the things that really matter to all of us, not just illnesses, but how well you are functioning throughout life. And to enable us to improve health, to understand biology and mechanisms. So we have a lot of people working on why these things happen as we get older. And um, in the last 30 years, you can see it's a huge collaboration between the research team international collaborators around the world, which Nick will talk about later. Mm -hmm. So we're collaborating with countries around the world, the funders who support us and participants. So the collaborations, you can see just pictures of all the many people in different specialties, eye diseases from Moorfields, uh, the eye center in, in London, um, international as, as well as local uh, physicians. And the large number of students and scientists physicians who've trained using data from EPIC. So you have trained the next generation of researchers. But most of all, none of this would have been possible without you, the participants. Everything completely hinges 
on your willing participation, your altruism in providing this data for us and being willing to be followed up and to tell us about your lives. So we are immensely grateful because none of the work that has been done would be possible without the, the, all of you as participants. And these are pictures just of the 25th anniversary, some of, the, some of you who may have come to St. Andrew's Church in Norfolk, 25 years, but also our very active EPIC participants advisory panel, and we will be meeting Peter Gibley, who have been really active in uh, giving feedback about our study, telling us what we're doing wrong, what they would like us to study, uh, going through all the um, ideas that we have and telling us what is interesting and what not to all of you. So we are really, really immensely grateful to all of you as participants. So we've seen some timeline of what you have taken part in over the years. We started out with cancer and heart disease, but over the time we've done body examinations, DEXA, looking at your bone health. We've uh, done accelerometry to measure your physical activity in more detail. We have um, measured your vision, your cognitive function, and lots and lots, I'm sure you're all aware of the, the huge number of questionnaires that you have uh, contributed to. But what you have enabled is more than 1,500 research publications over the last 30 years. Cancer and all these endpoints on cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's, depression, functional health, quality of life, um, cognition, depression. So there's a wealth of information that you have provided for us and for the rest of the world based on the information you've given us. The role of diet, physical activity, stress, all much, much clearer through what you have told us about. That's not just the research, because research isn't valuable unless it does something for us. So that has contributed to changes in health guidelines, in policy, um, as well as training the next generation. So it's really critical that the next generation of researchers are, are still able to address the questions that are important to us and to address new questions as they arise. So just to give you two examples of results that we've had, you took part and gave us measures of lung function, pulse, good bone, uh, bone health, et cetera. And some of these measures predict very good subjective health as in quality of life, as well as objective health, like cancer, heart disease, and death in men and women. Hip fracture um, risk is related to lung function. The better your lung function, the lower hip fracture risk. Your blood sugar, and this is a, a measure that Nick initiated. So the EPIC is one of the leading studies in terms of diabetes, understanding diabetes, obesity, and physical activity. But, but that uh, your blood sugar is a predictor of mortality. But some of the information you have provided has contributed to um, World Health Organization guidelines on how we measure osteoporosis and scans. And um, the um, data you provided on your lifestyle four simple health behaviors. So you tell us what you've been doing. So if you have four simple health behaviors, good health behaviors, one being a non-smoker, one being a moderate alcohol drinker, one being not totally physically inactive. So anything beyond being a total couch potato and one where you eat five servings of fruit and vegetables a day. If you have four of those health behaviors, you have one fifth the chance of death or cancer or heart disease over the next 15 years. And 25% of all of you were able to practice these health behaviors. So we're talking about everyday living lifestyle conditions that all of us are able to do. We're not talking about any extremes. And this is what you have told us about or what you have shown us. So that's equivalent for health behaviors to 14 years difference in life expectancy. And this has influenced uh, policies such as the Department of Health, small changes, big differences in terms of um, what we can do to uh, improve our own health. So again, the main reason that I, would, I want to be here so much is to say a really um, heartfelt thank you to all of you for your altruism, your time, giving up your time to come today as well to hear about results and taking part in the, in the study. Thank you very much. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Katie. We'll hold the questions, if we may, till later in the session. Uh, I'm sure you have many, and I'm sure Katie will be only too happy to, to address them. So one of the things I showed on the initial slide 
about the uh, the study was that you gave quite a lot of blood uh, back in the early 90s. And there were things that we could measure at the time. And there were a whole series of things that you couldn't even imagine that being being possible to measure. And there are, you know, um, it would have been impossible in 1992 to think about measuring genetic variants on, on every person in the study, uh, you know, 30 million variants per person. It's just impossible. It would have been impossible to think about some of the things on the poster about measuring, you know, 5,000 proteins in every single person in a tiny drop of blood because no one had developed that technology. So one of the key things about the study and its origin was that um, people had the foresight to say, let's store the blood and let's store it in a way that's really careful and allows us to, uh, to defrost it and use it in the future without having decayed. And that sounds easy to do, but it's incredibly complex and it requires a lot of careful attention. So it's a real privilege to ask Steve Knighton to tell you about what we've been doing to look after these samples so carefully so that we can use them for science. So Steve, thanks for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Knighton. Um, I am the sample facilities manager for the unit. Um, and in that role, um, my main concern is looking after all the biological samples that we store. Sorry, I'll just move this one. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so I'm, I look after all the biological samples that we store in the unit. Um, and one of, the, one of the main studies that we store in terms of numbers of samples is Epic Norfolk. Um, so we have a huge number of samples stored for Epic Norfolk. Um, you're probably all familiar with this, um, this graph here, this diagram. Um, the bit I'm most interested in here is the biospecimen sample. So you can see at the first three health checks is when we collected all the blood um, and urine, um, and we also extracted DNA from the blood. Um, and for each participant, we, there are numerous um, multiple um, sample tubes stored. Um, so we have a, a huge number in storage. And like I say, this area here is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the storage of Epic Norfolk samples, and in particular, okay, just one second. I think Paul's trying to sort it out. Yeah. So, Steve, I think if you, in addition to turning the mic up a little bit, if you, <laughs> you raise your voice. Yes, and, um, yeah. I'll do my best. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> Not the people who wrote mine. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> in terms of uh, in terms of samples stored, uh, we have a few different sample types that we store for Epic Norfolk. Um, so we have whole blood, which is collected from from the volunteers. We had um, urine also collected um, from the whole blood. What we tend to do is um, separate it out into its constituent parts. Um, so the the plasma and the serum, which is the sort of the watery part of the blood. Um, we, we separate out, and that's very useful in um, quite a lot of analyses um, that, that go on. Um, we also have the, the buffy coat layer, which is the, the middle layer that you get when you separate the blood out. Um, this contains the white blood cells, um, which we then use for DNA extraction. Um, and then we also have red blood cells as well, which are also useful for, for many different analyses. Um, and then there are different options for storing the samples. Um, so what we're trying to do is, the, the, the colder we store the samples, um, the, the longer the sample life lifeline, um, and the longer we can store them for, and the more usable they are for a longer period. Um, so, there, you know, we can store some samples in a fridge temporarily uh, to keep them fresh, uh, but the majority of samples we freeze for long-term storage. Um, so some samples can be quite, um, can last for quite a long time, at minus 20, for example, the, the urine samples that we store. So the majority of the Epic Norfolk urine samples, they're, they're stored at, at minus 20. Um, but for longer term storage, and particularly the storage of blood, we store it at, at minus 80 degrees, either minus 70 or minus 80 degrees. Um, and then for very long term storage um, samples, if we want to store them almost indefinitely, we, we store them in liquid nitrogen as well. So a proportion of the Epic Norfolk bloods that we store, we've put into liquid nitrogen so that we can 
we can store them for a very long period and, and over time we can we can then use them for analysis so i'm just going to talk a little bit about the the journey that the samples have been on over, over the years over the last 30 years um, so we have had to move them around a little bit and improve the storage um, of the samples um, so initially when we first collected um, the samples the first two health checks um, they were stored at a facility up in Attleborough, not far from here. Um, then in around about the year 2000, we, we moved them closer to where we, we were based in Cambridge um, at, a, at, a, at a commercial storage facility. Um, now, this was just a, a sort of a commercial warehouse almost. So we had our freeze in a warehouse. It wasn't, wasn't the best place for storing samples, really. Um, so we, we, in around the, about the year 2007, um, we tried to, we, we moved our samples across to a, a facility down at Bishop Stortford. Um, so this is a commercial facility specifically set up for storing biological samples. So it's a much better place. The samples were a lot safer there. All the freezers there were monitored in terms of their temperatures. Uh, there were backup generators and things to, to make sure the samples didn't defrost and that they were safe in that facility. Um, we did have a few, it being a commercial facility, we, we didn't always have the best access to our samples. Um, and we are, we are trying to use the samples all the time because they're very valuable in the research. So we need to have access to these samples. So um, we didn't always have the best access there. They restricted us a little bit um, and it was a very costly endeavor to have them stored there. So what we thought is we try and, try and bring the storage in house, try and uh, bring all our samples together and basically open a facility ourselves where we could, we could store the samples safely. We could have good access to the samples um, all on one site. So in year 2021, a couple of years ago, uh, we moved all our samples onto our new facility at Cambridge Research Park. So this is just north of Cambridge, just outside the city, um, at Water Beach. Um, and that's where we are now. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about the new facility. Um, so here are some pictures of the new facility. Um, so as I mentioned, we keep the majority of our samples in these minus 80 freezers or minus 70, 70 to 80 degrees. Um, and this just shows some of them here. Um, these freezers can hold around about 40,000 samples. Um, and currently we have 50 of these freezers. So that gives you an idea of the, the numbers of samples we're storing. And a big proportion of those are Epic Norfolk samples as well. It's one of our, one of our bigger studies that we have. Um, as I mentioned, we also have liquid nitrogen storage for very long-term storage of samples. Uh, these are our seven liquid nitrogen tanks we have here. Um, all of these tanks contain Epic Norfolk bloods. Um, you can see the, the straws here. So what we've, what we've done is we put the Epic Norfolk bloods into these different, different colored straws for the different sample types. Uh, and then the straws go into the goblets here and the goblets are stacked up one on top of each other in the, in the liquid nitrogen tanks. And this gives us the opportunity to keep these samples almost indefinitely because they're at such a cold temperature. They can, they can last a very, very long time. Um, so we also have a, a minus 20 um, freezer room, a walk-in freezer room where all the, all the Epic Norfolk uh, urine is stored. Uh, the picture here shows uh, before we actually moved any samples into it, uh, but these racks are, are all filled up now of mainly Epic Norfolk urines uh, and a few other studies as well. It's set up with a, a dual compression system. So if, if, if one, one uh, cooling system should fail, we have a, a second cooling system in place uh, to make sure we don't lose any samples at all. So it's, it's, it's a safe system. One of the other technological innovations we've, uh, we've tried to implement is um, this Arctic minus 70 auto store. So this is very similar to our, our, our minus 70 freezers in that it stores samples at that temperature. But what it does is it, it automatically stores the samples for us. So with a normal freezer, you'd have to go in, you, you'd open the door, put the samples in yourself and have to pick them out yourselves. With this one, what we can do is we can put a rack of samples in, the machine will take the samples in, it will store them for us. Uh, and then when we need particular samples, we can give it a list of, list of sample IDs and it will just pull them out for us. It massively reduces the amount of time we're spending on picking samples. Um, so it's a really good innovation um, going forward. Um, in terms of the, the risks to samples, what we're trying to avoid at all costs is the samples defrosting. Um, so we, we've, we've had a look at the, the risks in the new building and what the risks could be. Um, and so we've implemented a few uh, systems to try and make sure we don't lose any samples. Um, so one of these is we've got a, a backup uh, electricity generator. So if there are any power outages at all, um, this will automatically kick in and provide electricity for the whole building for a, a long period. 
until we can get the, the electricity running again. Um, we also have all our freezers are uh, monitored, the temperature monitored on this T-scan uh, software system here. So we can, we can log in remotely from anywhere on a computer or even on a phone um, and just check the, check, the, check the temperature of any freezer at any time. Uh, and if any freezer does start to warm up, we get an, an alarm sent to us. I get an alarm on my phone telling me I have to go in and, and move the samples to another freezer. Um, so it's, it's, it's very safe. The samples are very safe here. Uh, we've also set up a contract um, with a, a, a company called MTS Cryo Stores. Uh, it's a disaster recovery uh, company. So if there was a major disaster at the site, if there was a fire, if there was a flood on the site, they would come and take our samples for us temporarily and store them for us. It's just, just to give that extra um, security for the samples. Um, when we're storing these samples in the minus 80 freezers, one of the issues we do have with the freezers is that each freezer produces a huge amount of heat inside the building. Um, and so we've had to, we have to look at the temperature control in, in the main warehouse area. Um, so one thing we've put in is this, is this large air handling unit on the left there. Um, this is um, a, a system which brings cooler air out. It removes the hot air that the, that the, the freezer are generating and removes it out to the outside and tries to bring cooler air through. Um, and um, during the summer months, it still does get quite hot in there, as you can imagine. A day like today, it will be, it will be quite hot. So we've also, for the, for the summer months, we also put in some, some extra cooling systems as well, just to make sure the freezers aren't at risk of breaking down because the hotter it gets, the more they start to struggle and the, the more risk there is to the samples if a, if a freezer fails. So looking forward, we are looking to try and replace a lot of our older freezers with a new system. Um, and at the moment, we currently have the builders in on site. They are currently constructing this new system, which is the Nordic system. Um, so this is a system where you still have individual uh, freezer cabinets, much like the cabinets we have now. Uh, but the, the refrigeration part is all centralized. Um, this makes it a lot more energy efficient. So we, we're going to be saving a lot of power. It's a lot more environmentally friendly. Um, and it, it, it improves the space as well. The, 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 the cabinets are taller um, and it, they're right next to each other. So we have a lot more store, sample storage space here as well. Um, and the, one of the best things about this as well, there's no heat generated inside the building as well. So we shouldn't have the problems that we are facing on very hot summers. This summer, last summer was very hot um, where, we, where the freezers struggle. This, this system shouldn't have that problem at all. Um, and here is just a little, little bit of data showing, uh, comparing the Nordic system with traditional minus 80 freezers. Uh, if you look at energy use on the top line, it's, it's almost a third of what a, a traditional, traditional set of freezers would use. Um, so it's, it's a lot more environmentally friendly. Uh, it's a lot more, it will save us a lot of money, save on electricity. Um, the CO2 production is, is a lot less. Um, and that's something that, that us as a unit and the university on a whole is, is, is uh, looking forward to try and become more sustainable overall. Um, and that's it for me. That's just a brief summary of our storage um, systems and how, we, how we're moving forward. Um, and I just want to say a big thank you to all the participants who provided samples. Um, without the samples, we wouldn't be able to do any of this science. Um, and I probably wouldn't have a job at all. So thank you very much. <laughs> So and a big thanks to Steve, he slightly understated it, but this time last year, he was going in evenings and weekends to, to try and move samples from one freezer to another because it was so hot. And um, you know, so thank you, Steve, for all your hard work. So we, we've just shown you there how we're trying to uh, use your samples scientifically, but also preserve them over time so that we can actually maximize the utility of, of the sample that you provided. We want to show you now how we've been trying to do the same thing with the data that you have provided, how we've linked it to other sources of data, and how we're trying to maximize the use of that in a safe way. So it's a pleasure to introduce my colleague Soren Braga, who's a program leader in the MRC Epidemiology Unit, who's going to speak about uh, issues about data. So Soren, you need a mic. I you have, have it one. on. Can you hear me? Otherwise, rest assured with small children, I will project my words accordingly. Right. OK, so you have provided us, obviously, with a lot of data. So I will talk about uh, data today. But it's not just data 
that you would have put two and two together and say, yeah, I know you did that measurement on me. I know you definitely have that. As you just heard, it's also the data that we had generated from doing additional measurements on your samples. And there's even more that we have done to enhance the complete data set that is Epic Norfolk. So my talk here today is about two parts. One is how we further enhance the information that we have gathered on you, data linkage in particular, and also the processes we have in place to keep your data accessible and safe for research. Okay, so data linkage. That is data, more information that comes into the study database without you having to do anything else than what you did very initially, that is consent to linkage to your health records. And these comes from all sorts of different places. Every time we go to the doctor, every time we go to the hospital, every time we have any measurement done as part of routine screening, there is data generated. And because you have given us permission to link to those data, that enriches the data set that is Epic Norfolk. So data linkage is about taking that data that we have already and linking it even further. So we allow more associations to be studied. So these are the sources that uh, we typically use. They are now uh, governed by the body called NHS England. Change over time, but that's the authority where we currently get your data from. That works. Um, and there's also a more local linkage, for example, with the retinal screening program uh, locally here in Norfolk. So that is coming into the data set. And obviously all of those types of data are quite sensitive. So we handle that very, very carefully. Before we get to that, let me just give you an example of how we might use some of these data to derive further data. So obviously some of these can be analyzed in their own right, but others require a little bit more work for us to derive the variable that is useful for a particular research question. For example, diabetes. We actually derive the variable diabetes status from seven different data sources, some of which come from the information you have given us when you come to be measured, and some of it comes from these different health records. And we put all the information together so that we are more certain that this person got diabetes at that time. And it gives us a lot more data to work with. So you can think about it as an amplifier, a, a power amplifier of the study. And it gives us more certainty about also that that person definitely did have diabetes rather than relying only on one case. So it's quite complex when you put all these seven data sources together and they have different timelines and we're trying to work out what time did that person get diabetes and are we sure they got diabetes, but that's our work. That's what we should do to maximize your information. And it, this resulted in us actually capturing, that's what we call it, capturing 4,000 or so cases of diabetes. And we wouldn't have captured that many if we'd only used uh, a single source of information. So I'm, I'm hoping I have explained that we need these types of data linked together in order to provide the most reliable information for any research question. Okay, so second part of my talk. This is about data out. This is about making your data available for research so we can change the world to a better place, hopefully. So, the main ambition is obviously to allow maximum use of the data, maximize your investment. As you saw before, it has resulted in over 1500 scientific publications. I can tell you that is a lot. Um, and this has been enabled through quite a liberal but controlled data access mechanism. Uh, we try and abide by this very uh, uh, snazzy acronym, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. 
difficult to, to use data if you don't know it exists. So that's, that's, that's basically it. So the FAIR principle is what we abide by. Okay. So we have different levels of sharing data. The safest is to not share it at all, but the safest is to report only averages, big averages, summary level statistics. That's what we call it. No person can be identified by a summary level statistic. Okay, so that's one avenue of sharing data. And then we have different mechanisms for making sure that that's the case. You can't really easily do all the research, the new research you want to do only using that method. So we also want to share individual level data. So that's where I can see each one of you's measurements and put two and together saying is X related to Y. We, we use that with a control process and we have different mechanisms of doing this process here. Okay, and I will try and, I'll try and go through this. So let's go to the summary level statistics first. Normally we would print the result or publish the results of a particular analysis in a scientific paper. Now, if there are lots of results, it's not very useful to print it all on a, on a piece of A4. So sometimes we need to put that online electronically. There's still summary level results, so nobody can be identified. So this is an example of the relationship between genetics and the proteins measured in the blood and the associations with various disease outcomes. Those association results, we can put on websites that are geared towards studies reporting a lot of results. And we report over a thousand results easily on each of these segments of analysis for this particular paper. And other researchers can now search those results and put them together in different ways and generate new insights. That's sharing summary level results in a quite an efficient way. Okay, sharing individual level data is more risky and also allows much more research to be done individually um, or uh, needing access to individual level data. So the classic method is people um, put a request in on the study website we review the request, we generally approve it. In fact, since we started counting this and logging this, we've only rejected three applications in this because we didn't have the data that they were asking for. So we generally approve all the applications that people uh, make in good faith. And two thirds of them actually are not from our own team. So this really makes maximum use of the Epic Norfolk data to researchers all over the world. This is probably even a little bit of an outdated map. There's probably more dots on it now as we speak. Um, but you can see that this, th this is handled by our own data management team. They are busy. They have released 300 data sets to people around the world who have a pr an approved uh, request. That's quite a lot of work. We don't really wanna keep doing it this way, but it is safe because we have vetted people uh, who have requested the data, okay? But it's tedious. Okay, this is how well, we have sort of tracked how it might grow over time. Obviously, 2023, it's not quite finished yet. So there will be a higher bar here. So we, we, we approve requests for data. We also approve uh, requests for analysis of samples. So not that many but that is also a possibility if somebody wants to do new measurements. Okay, the new approach for sharing data is different. Not shipping out data sets and emailing it to people or providing access uh, to our unit servers, which are not that big, but it is more about keeping it on a big computer and allowing people access in. So this is about access control to the data, but the data does not move. Okay, so this is different, but the result is the same. It enables the same research. It just means that people have to log into our supercomputer instead of being handed a file to analyze the data set on their own, okay? 
but they have to log in with credentials, has to be approved. It's also safer because we don't really know truly always that people follow what they said they were going to do in the, in the original plan. It hasn't happened so far that they didn't, but there is a risk and this allows us to control that a little bit better. So I want to thank you, obviously, for participating in the study, allowing people such as me to do lots of excellent research uh, on the data. But particularly for this talk, I'd like to also trust you with, uh, I thank you for the trust that you have placed in us, that we will keep maximizing your investment and your trust in us. And we will look after your data safely, and we will make sure that we will keep enhancing it by pulling more data into the resource. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Soren. So I thought it was really important that you heard about how we were using uh, careful mechanisms to look after your samples and look after your data. But the reason you gave it to us in the first place was actually for the science. And it's now a pr privilege to introduce my colleague, Nita Free, who's also a program leader uh, in our unit and a professor at University of Cambridge. And Nita is going to talk about some of the more recent results from the study. And it's very good that you're here. Nita hasn't been involved in a boxing match. <laughs> uh, she unfortunately fell over. So she's now using her wonky hand to control this. So if it goes wrong, it's because she's right-handed. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And it is such a privilege to be able to speak with you today and to meet so many of you in person. Um, I don't normally look like this, but I wasn't going to miss this day for anything. So let me tell you about some of the more recent achievements. And for that, I'm going to focus on the last 10 years, 2013 to 2023. And I'm going to focus particularly, as Nick just alluded to, on the science that you have enabled us to deliver. So Katie and others, uh, Professor Kaur and others have mentioned about the 1,500 or so publications that have come out of this study. Well, this is what it looks like for the last 10 years. That's close to 700 publications based on the EPIC Norfolk study standalone or with the consortia, the consortiums that we were talking about, and also making the data available to researchers all over the world, really. Now, in many endeavors, we all know from our personal lives, over time, things sort of drop off, there's attrition. Think about gym membership, we join enthusiastically and then, oh dear, I haven't been in six months. With Epic Norfolk, absolutely the opposite. So in fact, in the last 10 years, if you do the maths, the numbers of publications coming out has accelerated. You know, this is nearly half of those publications in the last 10 years. So the rate of productivity is going up and that is quite a feat. Now, rest assured, I'm not going to talk about all the 680 publications next, but let me show you just some examples because I think they bring to light what you have made possible. So many of you will know <laughs> that over time, as we age, we also put on a bit of weight and we all know that increasing weight is not brilliant for health. There is, however, a greater understanding that by and large, people can be divided into being apple-shaped or pear-shaped, and generally it goes male-female in the way that I've shown there. Um, so waist circumference by measuring how, what your girth is around the middle of your body is a good way to look at health. Until your results, there was very little known from a UK population about this, and particularly most other studies had only looked at what your waist might have been like at the start of the study. Your Epic Norfolk contribution allowed us all those repeated health checks and measurements, so we were able to look at change. And what we found is that for each uh, person, or over, on average rather, if the waist circumference increased by more than five centimeters over follow-up around four years or so, that was associated with a higher mortality risk. So from this, we concluded that waist circumference may be a better indicator than weight itself. But we wanted to go further. 
So what we did here was to say, well, putting us uh, a measure tape around your waist gives us the girth or circumference, but actually there's a link between that and what your hip circumference or the girth around your hips is. And that's known as the waist hip ratio, which is also a marker of deep abdominal and fat that you store under the skin. So here we use genetics. So this brings us to the sample storage that you heard about from Steve and, and the new analyses. What we found was that a higher waist to hip ratio overall, of course, we know it can either be due to the top part, which is the waist being higher, or it could be due to a lower or reduced storage of fat around the hips. Now using genetics, we looked at the genetic markers for both of those. You know, what genetic markers are related to your waist and what genetic markers are related to the fat around your hips. And both of these were related with higher risk of disease in the future. So this was first time novel evidence that if there is an inability to store fat in the healthier place, which is around the hips rather than around the waist, which is uh, greater uh, adverse impacts, then that can cause problems. So this is really important, uh, new understanding that we will now follow up with further research. Then we delved even further and we wanted to understand mechanisms of disease. And this again links back to Professor Wareham's comment about when we stored the samples originally, we had no idea what technology will become available in the future. So here we measured over a thousand small molecules, which are called metabolites in the blood. And these were related to 27 different disease conditions. Professor Kaur mentioned the uh, multitude of disease conditions we have been able to study. And here we looked at 27 of them. Now, half of these blood markers were related to at least one disease condition. And two thirds of the disease associated markers were shared between at least two diseases. Now we know as we age, it is common to acquire more than one illness or disease. You know, you might have diabetes or heart disease at the same time and so on. So this is really new understanding that there are shared biochemical pathways uh, for multiple medical conditions. And this opens up potentials for new therapeutic options, new treatments and prevention uh, and early identification. So this is another important finding. Next, I want to move away from showing you those mechanisms and pathways to looking at what we can actually do about this in real life. And there's a lot of work on physical activity and sedentary behavior and so on, but I will focus today only on the diet part because of the time. Um, so here, one of the age old controversies for at least 50 years has been around the role of saturated fat. And of course, we've all heard the public health message to reduce the intake of fat in our diet and particularly saturated fat. We had this hypothesis that it's not only the fat, i.e. the nutrient, but the foods that are rich in these fats may behave differently. So we tested that out. Here, what this shows is that all of these foods are rich in fat, but the fermented dairy products like yogurt and cheese are in fact to the left-hand side of, uh, you know, the right hand shows increased risk, the left hand shows decreased risk, and this is in relation to heart disease. What it shows is that butter, red meat, and meat that is processed, these are related with higher risk over time of heart disease, whereas the fermented dairy products are related with lower risk. So what this shows us is that a focus only on the nutrient is misleading because foods are very complex things with thousands of things going on inside them. So we need to look at whole foods, not just the nutrient. And the last thing I want to uh, talk about uh, in, in relation to food here is that when we have the data from you, when you've told us what you've been eating, there's a slight danger that we might have biased findings because people who eat healthier are also generally more physically active. There are also people who don't smoke and they drink in moderation and so on. So the findings can be biased. So a good way to overcome that bias is to look at markers of dietary intakes in the blood because the blood test can't lie while we might subconsciously believe we eat healthier or unhealthier. So two, two examples here. First one is for that fat, saturated fat thing that I just, uh, data that I just showed you, we found biomarkers in the blood that indicate markers of dairy fat. 
And when we associated those to the risk of diabetes, we found exactly the same as we had done for heart disease with the self-report or subjective reporting. So the blood test confirmed that we were on the right track. And a second example here is, you may have already seen the poster by one of our PhD students. This is in relation to red meat. So the previous slide I showed you showed that there was an increased risk of higher meat intake and raised risk of coronary heart disease. Here, we did an experiment using those small molecules and we found biomarkers of red meat intake. And these were indeed related with meat intake and with increased risk of diabetes. So again, this was an objective way to overcome some of those biases from the self-report. I want to leave you with just one example of what Professor Kaur was referring to about the impact of your work and your uh, research contributions to policy. And this is in relation to work we did on looking at sugary drinks. So, you know, here's Coca-Cola. It could be any sugar sweetened beverage. And we had found that habitual consumption of these on a regular basis, uh, more than one of these per day, is linked to greater risk of diabetes. Now, this went all the way to us as researchers, not just sort of publishing the paper and going home for tea and saying, right, what's our next paper? But we went on to communicate this widely because actually the media contacted us, they were interested. And it was all over the news. Uh, here's uh, yours truly on the one show. Uh, we, uh, I got a seat at the table to go to Public Health England and, and, and be part of the dialogue on sugar reduction. Here's Prof Wareham. He got a seat at the table to go to the Houses of Parliament and you know, to, to present evidence to the Health Committee. And you know, all of this leads them to public health action. And the final thing I want to say is your contribution to research and our publication of that led all the way to that evidence getting into various guidelines and reports from, for example, the World Health Organization, et cetera. And ultimately, we were also part of the narrative where this evidence informed the sugary drinks tax, if you will, or the levy direct to the manufacturers of these drinks. The levy was announced by the chancellor in 2016 and implemented in 2018. So all of this has been made possible through your contributions. And really, I want to end by thanking you again for this. And as Professor Kaur said, your altruism uh, in, in doing this. We couldn't have done this without you. Thank you. Great, thanks um, very much, Nita. You can see that I did the serious uh, presentation to Parliament and Nita did the show business with Lenny <laughs> Henry. <laughs> so, uh, quite right too, yeah. We're now gonna have a brief panel discussion. So if colleagues want to join in the comfy chairs, we're gonna, we're gonna do a bit of a warm up before we invite you to uh, ask questions of them or anyone in the team. But uh, before you've met three of the uh, colleagues already, but I just want to introduce Peter to you. You're going to, uh, okay. He's I'm just being, being switched on. Mic'd up. Sorry, are you having this one? I don't need that. So Peter is the chairman of the EPIC Participant Advisory Panel, which is a group that we put together quite a few years ago. And it's great to see members of that committee here today. And Peter, it's great that you have been chairing it. I understand you're, you're going to step down. But, I am, uh, yes, I've but you've, got a bit older. Yeah, as have we all from some of the pictures you've probably gathered. Uh, Peter, could you tell us, please do yes. sit down, but Thank can you. you tell us a little bit about what the panel is for and what you, how you see your role? I think the panel is, um, I thought about this carefully because it's quite difficult to pinpoint. The panel is not itself proactive. It doesn't generate. What it does is receive, monitor, uh, I'd love to say challenge, but it doesn't have to be too challenging. Uh, and it is a group of people who I think um, have been trusted and respected to take a positive view about the work that they are um, presented with. Uh, more than that, no, it, it, it isn't a, a, a panel that changes much. 
it's a panel that I hope has been uh, supportive and at times maybe um, challenging, but basically has been glad to be very supportive. And that's where we are. Can I see a show of hands of panel members who are here? One, two, not too many, three, four. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So um, one of the challenges that we have is that uh, regulatory authorities tend to uh, be very restrictive because they say, hang on a minute, how, what, what was the thinking about informed consent? Because you have informed, provided informed consent in 1993 or four, and you know, it doesn't, you didn't mention NHS England. And, and you know approval for linkage to NHS England. And we go back to those regulatory authorities and said, yes, but it didn't exist. So how could we, how could we uh, have predicted that? So for us, the voice of the participants is really important mm. in, um, in, in us being able to say, we have talked to you and it's not, we can't talk to everybody, but Peter, do you think that you, are able as a group to reflect the views of participants on what they expected of the study and what they expect of us to do with the trust that's been given to us? Well, I think two things there. We don't know for certain what um, participants as a whole uh, think, wish, feel, um, but we are ourselves participants and pretty normal participants, I think, and we consult together, we meet enough to um, have a uh, feeling of being a body, um, and we gain uh, from having presentations to us that are, I'm going to put this my way, at our level. I don't want to hear something deeply scientific. It wouldn't, well, I might hear it, but it wouldn't be much use to get a response from me to something deeply scientific. But something, I've put it crudely, something deeply personal about people and the effect on people and the way it's going is something that the panel is very good at um, recognizing and has been, I hope, um, very responsible in its uh, responses. And we've, we have discussed some fairly challenging issues at times. Should we collaborate? It's easy to say we should collaborate with, with researchers at the University of Cambridge, researchers outside that. But we have had discussions about should we collaborate with people from, from industry, for example. And yeah. I think the, the views of the panel have been very helpful on that. Would you want to say anything further? On I that? don't really want to say much about that, but I, um, I think the panel has... I always feel, Nick, that um, the panel should reflect the views of a wider group of people as much as possible. So it's not going to be very extreme in its views. It's going to hope, I hope, take the common sense approach and the supportive approach. So what I would want when you talk about something, an initiative that you're wanting to take forward, um, I would want to know from you, not so much the technical aspects of the initiative, but the morality of it, how you stand about it, where it is amongst the wider um, scientific community. And generally speaking, I have been delighted with the um, level at which you've been able to work with us, which is certainly not a heavily scientific bias. It's been uh, we've been able to focus on the implications mm -hmm. and the future. Yeah. I mean, from our perspective, I just you know, want to thank you for chairing and thank everyone else for doing it. If there are people who would like to join the committee, we'd love to hear from you. I think it's, it plays an immensely important role for us. It's very powerful for me as the leader of this to be able to say to regulatory authorities and to other bodies, you know, yes, you might think that, but our participants are telling us this. Mm. They gave us the data, the blood to be used to further science and they want it to be used to that end. So it, it does really 
help us immensely. So just thank you on behalf of the whole team for all your efforts uh, in the EPAP. Thank, thank you. So Katie, one of the things I wanted to ask you is that um, you're obviously, you know, there at the beginning. Could you, could you even have imagined forward thinking 30 years to 1500 papers. Where, where, did, where did you think this was heading when you set it up? <laughs> <laughs> Tricky question, sorry. Yes. Well, we, we thought it was really important to have, have information about people living their ordinary lives in, uh, in Britain. And there was so little information. And so the start of that, was to really just find out more about your health, your life, your lifestyle. So that, that was the main thing and what we could do to help improve it. Um, but where I, I did some of my earlier work in the United States, and I was very struck there by somebody who taught me. She started a study in Rancho Bernardo Retirement Community in 1971. And she was one of the only ones in this national study who saved blood samples. And then 20 years later, I spent hours in the deep freeze retrieving blood samples, able to measure things that she didn't have the technology or the funding to do in 1971. And that was enormously uh, a lesson in terms of the value of saving data, saving blood samples for the future where you don't know what technology is possible. When we started doing genetic, it was like a thousand pounds to do a few genes. And now you can do you know, the whole range. So I, I think the idea was to maximize the potential mm. of, the, of the study from the samples that you gave us to make sure that they would be able to be used in the future as new technologies arose and as new questions arose because mm. the questions have also changed. Um, mm. And so it was as pluripotential as possible, but we didn't know what would be possible. And I think we owe a lot to you, Nate, in the terms of how you driven mm. the study forward, yeah. which is on a completely different professional level from when we first started, which was very tiny little shed. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, it, it entirely depends on the participation of the people, of all of you, but also on the scientific leadership. And mm. we're immensely grateful to you and your team for that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you're very kind, thank you. So Nita, the, Katie just mentioned that the scientific questions have changed mm -hmm. and you hinted, I think, at uh, people having multiple conditions. Do you think, we, we sometimes call that multi-morbidity, so multiple con conditions. Do you, do you think that's one of the major things that's altered and should be a focus of future study? I think that is definitely one of the major things, not the only one, of course, lots of things there's new knowledge over the last 30 years. And the Epic Norfolk study is ready to tackle really any given new hypothesis pretty much that comes along because of the investment that has been made in it. So multimorbidity is basically when you have more than one health condition at the same time, for instance, you know, one could have dementia and diabetes or any you know, high blood pressure and diabetes or heart disease. Etc. So to be able to study that is really important because as overall in our nation, people are living longer, which is a great thing, we're also acquiring more disease burden. And to be able to study that, you know, more than, I think it's something like more than 60% of over 65 year olds have multimorbidity. So it's really important to be able to tackle that. And with the repeated measurements and data collection and dietary information, physical activity information, we are very much able to study that. And, and that is one of the new, I, th I think going to be a, a game changer in the field. And, and there are others, for instance, being able to look at objectively measured physical activity. So we're not just relying on people thinking, oh, well, I did, you know, I walked a lot or I ran a lot. Well, now we have smartphones in our pockets, which can tell us, you know, that is progress. And, and then colleagues like Soren implement that more rigorously into the study itself. And similarly for the diet side, we, we can measure these biomarkers. So there, there's a lot that we're now able to do. So you mentioned uh, physical activity and some of the work Soren's done. Last night, I actually had, gave an interview to The Economist. A journalist rang me up because it's 70 years ago, not since one of Soren's papers came out, but <laughs> 70 years ago that a 
a former colleague of ours, actually we wrote a paper with him uh, before he died, Jerry Morris, he, he died at the age of 99 and was a big proponent of physical activity. And in 1953, he wrote a paper about comparing heart attack risk in bus conductors who were up and down the stairs on the bus all day to the drivers who were sedentary. And before that, people actually thought physical activity was bad for you and you probably should minimize it because you don't want to overstress yourself. And Jerry Morris was the first person who, who really started a revolution about focusing on physical activity. And Soren, do you want to say a few words about the contribution of Epic Norfolk to taking that vision of Jerry Morris on? Yeah, certainly. So that uh, seminal study published in 1953 used a binary definition of physical activity. You, you were either active or you were not, i.e. you were either the bus conductor or you were not. At least we were able to do a little bit better in Epic Norfolk. So when we started in 1993, um, we didn't have all the technology available that we could just uh, instrument you with little accelerometers and movement sensors and then send you home for a week. So we relied on self-report. Um, but Epic Norfolk actually is unique in the sense that we did try and quantify the amount of physical activity that you were doing at, in a more nuanced manner, a, a finer grain of the scale, if you will. Plus, we were able to do lots of validation studies in the population so that we can better translate that information. And that has really allowed us to... Um, amplify the information that we collected on you early on because elapsed time and the change in behaviors over that time was very powerful in studying the association with the sea. So not just how active were you in 1993 to 97 when we first studied you, but also how did that change over time? And we can see the people who maintain the activity level, they're doing a lot better than people who are declining. It's natural to decline. So the average is to decline, but many people maintained, a few people increased. That's not a lot, but lots of people maintain their activity level. And we can see that those people who maintain their activity level over say a 10 year lifespan, they do a lot better in not getting diseases in the next 10 years. So Epic Norfolk has allowed us to do that. Yes. And that's all based on self-report, but we anchor the self-report in objective measurements that are now available today. And if you're still taking part in the study, you've probably been instrumented with some of our little gizmos that of course do measure things a lot more precisely, but it's not that we've forgotten all the, uh, the, the gold dust that you sprinkled on the study in the past, because we can still make use of that. Mm -hmm. We're putting two and two together and say, this is how it relates. This is what people have told us they've been doing over time. And it's immensely informative. Uh, for example, when Nick goes and talks to the House of Commons and talks some sense into them, what their guidelines should be. Yeah, interesting challenge, that one. I can <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 